The Blue Hotel by Stephen Crane. The Palace Hotel at Fort Romper was painted a light blue, a shade that is on the legs of a kind of heron, pausing the bird to declare its position against any background. The Palace Hotel then was always screaming and howling in a way that made the dazzling winter landscape of Nebraska seem only a gray swampish hush. It stood alone on the prairie, and when the snow was falling the town, in the town 200 yards away, it was not visible. But when the traveler alighted at the railway station, he was obliged to pass the Palace Hotel before he could come upon the company of low clabbered houses which composed Fort Romper, and it was not to be thought that any traveler could pass the Palace Hotel without looking at it. Pat Scully, the proprietor, had proved himself a master of strategy when he chose his paints. It is true that on clear days, when the great transcontinental expresses, long lines of swaying Pullmans swept through Fort Romper, passengers were overcome at the sight, and the cult that knows the brown reds and the subdivisions of the dark greens of the east expressed shame, pity, and horror in a laugh. But to the citizens of this prairie town, and to the people who would naturally stop there, Pat Scully had performed a feat. With this opulence and splendor, these creeds, classes, and egotisms that streamed through Romper on the rails day after day, they had no color in common. As if the displayed delights of such a blue hotel were not sufficiently enticing, it was Scully's habit to go every morning and evening to meet the leisurely trains that stopped at Romper and work his seductions upon any man that he might see wavering, grip sack in hand. One morning when a snow-crusted engine dragged its long string of freight cars and its one passenger coach to the station, Scully performed the marvel of catching three men. One was a shaky and quick-eyed Swede with great shining cheap valise. One was a tall bronzed cowboy who was on his way to a ranch near the Dakota line. One was a little silent man from the east who didn't look it and didn't denounce it. Scully practically made them prisoners. He was so nimble and merry and kindly that each probably felt it would be the height of brutality to try to escape. They trudged off over the creaking board sidewalks in the wake of the eager little Irishman. He wore a heavy fur cap squeezed tightly down on his head. It caused his two red ears to stick out stiffly, as if they were made of tin. At last Scully, elaborately with boisterous hospitality, conducted them through the portals of the Blue Hotel. The room which they entered was small. It seemed to be merely a proper temple for an enormous stove, which in the center was humming with godlike violence. At various points on its surface, the iron had become luminous and glowed yellow from the heat. Beside the stove, Scully's son Johnny was playing high-five with an old farmer who had whiskers both gray and sandy. They were quarreling. Frequently, the old farmer turned his face towards a box of sawdust, colored brown from tobacco juice, that was behind the stove and spat with an air of great impatience and irritation. With a loud flourish of words, Scully destroyed the game of cards and bustled his son upstairs with part of the baggage of new guests. He himself conducted them to three basins of the coldest water in the world. The cowboy and the Easterner burnished themselves fiery red with this water until it seemed to be some kind of a metal polish. The Swede, however, merely dipped his fingers gingerly and with trepidation. It was notable that throughout this series of small ceremonies, the three travelers were made to feel that Scully was very benevolent. He was conferring great favors upon him. He handed the towel from one to the other with an air of philanthropy a philanthropic impulse. Afterward, they went to the first room and, sitting about the stove, listened to Scully's officious clamor at his daughters, who were preparing the midday meal. They reflected in the silence of an experienced man who tread carefully amid new people. Nevertheless, the old farmer, stationary, invincible in his chair near the warmest part of the stove, turned his face from the sawdust box frequently and addressed a glowing commonplace to the strangers. Usually he was answered in short but adequate sentences by either the cowboy or the Easterner. The Swede said nothing. He seemed to be occupied in making furtive estimates of each man in the room. One might have thought that he had the sense of silly suspicion, which comes to guilt. He resembled a badly frightened man. Later at dinner he spoke a little, addressing his conversation entirely to Scully. He volunteered that he'd come from New York, where for ten years he'd worked as a tailor. These facts seemed to strike Scully as fascinating, and afterward he volunteered that he had lived at Romper for 14 years. The Swede asked about the crops and the price of labor. He seemed barely to listen to Scully's extended replies. His eyes continued to rove from man to man. Finally, with a laugh and a wink, he said that some of these western communities were very dangerous, 
and after his statement, he straightened his legs under the table, tilted his head, and laughed again loudly. It was plain that the demonstration had no meaning to the others. They looked at him wondering, and in silence. As the men trooped heavily back to the front room, the two little windows presented views of a turmoiling sea of snow. The huge arms of the wind were making attempts, mighty, circular, and futile, to embrace the flakes as they sped. A gatepost like a still man with a blanched face stood aghast amid this prof prof profligate fury. In a hearty voice, Scully announced the presence of a blizzard. The guests of the Blue Hotel, lighting their pipes, assented with grunts of lazy masculine contentment. No island of the sea could be exempt in the degree of this little room with its humming stove. Johnny, son of Scully, in a tone which defined his opinion of his ability as a card player, challenged the old farmer of both gray and sandy whiskers to a game of high five. The farmer agreed with a contemptuous and bitter scoff. They sat close to the stove and squared their knees under a wide board. The cowboy and the Easterner watched the game with interest. The Swede remained near the window, aloof, but with a countenance that showed signs of inexplicable excitement. The play of Johnny and the Greybeard was suddenly ended by another quarrel. The old man arose while casting a look of heated scorn at his adversary. He slowly buttoned his coat and stalked with fabulous dignity from the room. In the discreet silence of all other men, the Swede laughed. His laughter rang somehow childish. Men by this time had begun to look at him askance, as if they wished to inquire what ailed him. A new game was formed jocosely. The cowboy volunteered to become the partner of Johnny, and then they all turned to ask the Swede to throw in his lot with the little Easterner. He asked some questions about the game, and learning that it wore many names, and that he'd played it when he was under an alias, he accepted the invitation. He strode towards the men nervously as if he expected to be assaulted. Finally seated, he gazed from face to face, and laughed shrilly. This laugh was so strange that the Easterner looked up quickly. The cowboy sat intent and with his mouth open, and Johnny paused, holding the cards with still fingers. Afterward, there was a short silence. Then Johnny said, Well, let's get at it. Come on, now. They pulled their chairs forward until their knees were bunched under the board. They began to play, and their interest in the game caused the others to forget the manner of the Swede. The cowboy was a board whacker. Each time that he held superior cards, he wanged them one by one with exceeding force down upon the improvised table and took the tricks with a glowing air of prowess and pride that sent thrills of indignation into the hearts of his opponents. A game with a board whacker in it is sure to become intense. The countenances of the Easterner and the Swede were miserable whenever the cowboy thundered down his aces and kings, while Johnny, his eyes gleaming with joy, chuckled and chuckled. Because of the absorbing play, none considered the strange ways of the Swede. They paid strict heed to the game. Finally, during a lull caused by a new deal, the Swede suddenly addressed Johnny. I suppose there have been a good many men killed in this room. The jaws of the others dropped and they looked at him. What in hell are you talking about, said Johnny. The Swede laughed again, his blatant laugh, full of a kind of false courage and defiance. Oh, you know what I mean, all right, he answered. Well, I'm a liar if I do, Johnny protested. The card was halted, and the men stared at the Swede. Johnny evidently felt that the son of the proprietor, he should make a direct inquiry. Now, what might you be driving at, mister? He asked. The Swede winked at him. He was a wink full of cunning. His fingers shook on the edge of the board. Or maybe you think I've been to nowheres. Maybe you think I'm a tenderfoot. I don't know nothing about you, answered Johnny. And I don't give a damn where you've been. All I got to say is I don't know what you're driving at. There ain't never been nobody killed in this room. The cowboy had been steadily gazing at the Swede, then spoke. What's wrong with you, mister? Apparently it seemed to the Swede that he was formidably menaced. He shivered and turned white near the corners of his mouth. He sent an appealing glance in the direction of the little Easterner. During these moments he did not forget to wear his air of advanced pot valor. They say they don't know what I mean, he remarked mockingly to the Easterner. The latter answered after prolonged and cautious reflection. I don't understand you, he said impassively. The Swede made a movement then which announced what he thought he had encountered treachery from the only quarter where he expected sympathy if not help. Oh, I see you're all against me. I see. The cowboy was in a state of deep stupefaction. Say, he cried as he tumbled the deck violently upon the board. Say, what you getting at, hey? 
The Swede sprang up with the celerity of a man escaping from a snake on the floor. I don't want to fight, he shouted. I don't want to fight. The cowboy stretched his long legs indolently and deliberately. His hands were in his pockets. He spat into the sawdust box. Well, who the hell thought you did, he inquired. The Swede backed rapidly toward a corner of the room. Her hand, his hands were out protectingly in front of his chest, but he was making an obvious struggle to control his fright. Gentlemen, he quavered, I suppose I'm going to be killed before I can leave this house. I suppose I'm going to be killed before I leave this house. In his eyes was the dying swan look. Through the windows could be seen the snow turning blue in the shadow of the dusk. The wind tore at the house, and some loose thing beat regularly against the clabberds like a spirit tapping. A door opened, and Scully himself entered. He paused in surprise as he noticed the tragic attitude of the Swede. Then he said, What's the matter here? The Swede answered him swiftly and eagerly. These men are going to kill me. Kill you, ejaculated Scully. Kill you? What are you talking? The Swede made the gesture of a martyr. Scully wheeled sternly upon his, st upon his son. What is this, Johnny? The lad had grown sullen. Well, damned if I know, he answered. I can't make no sense to it. He began to shuffle the cards, fluttering them together with an angry snap. He says a good many men have been killed in this room, or something like that, and he says he's going to be killed here too. I don't know what ails him. He's crazy, I shouldn't wonder. Scully then looked for explanation to the cowboy, but the cowboy simply shrugged his shoulders. Kill you? said Scully again to the Swede. Kill you? Man, you're off your nut. Oh, I know, burst out the Swede. I know what will happen. Yes, I'm crazy, yes. Of course, I'm crazy, yes, but I know one thing. There's a sort of sweat of misery and terror upon his face. I know I won't get out of here alive. The cowboy drew a deep breath as if his mind was passing to the last stages of dissolution. Well, I'm doggone, he whispered to himself. Scully wheeled suddenly and faced his son. You been troubling this man? Johnny's voice was loud with its burden of grievance. Why, good God, I ain't done nothing to him. The Swede broke in. Gentlemen, do not disturb yourselves. I will leave this house. I will go away because, he accused them dramatically with his glance, because I do not want to be killed. Scully was furious with his son. Will you tell me what's the matter, you young devil? What's the matter anyhow? Speak out. Well, blame it, cried Johnny in despair. Don't I tell you? I don't know. He, he says we want to kill him, and that's all I know. I can't tell what ails him. The Swede continued to repeat. Never mind, Mr. Scully. Never mind. I will leave this house. I will go away because I do not wish to be killed. Yes, of course I am crazy, yes, but I know one thing. I will go away. I will leave this house. Never mind, Mr. Scully. Never mind. I will go away. You will not go away, said Scully. You'll not go away until I hear the reason of this business. If anybody's trouble you, I will take care of them. This is my house. You are under my roof, and I will not allow any peaceful man to be troubled here. He cast a terrible eye upon Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner. Never mind, Mr. Scully, never mind. I will go away. I do not wish to be killed. The Swede moved towards the door, which opened upon the stairs. It was evidently his intention to go at once for his baggage. No, no, shouted Scully peremptorily, but the white-faced man slid by him and disappeared. Now, said Scully severely, what does this mean? Johnny and the cowboy cried together. Why, we didn't do nothing to him. Scully's eyes were cold. No, he said. You didn't? Johnny swore a deep oath. Well, this is the wildest loon I ever see. We didn't do nothing at all. We were just sitting here playing cards, and he... The father suddenly spoke to the Easterner. Mr. Blank, he asked. What has these boys been doing? The Easterner reflected again. I didn't see anything wrong at all, he said at last slowly. Scully began to howl. But what does it mean? He stared ferociously at his son. I have a mind to lather you for this, my boy. Johnny was frantic. Well, what have I done? He bawled at his father. I think you are tongue-tied, said Scully finally to his son, the cowboy and the Easterner, and at the end of this scornful sentence, he left the room. Upstairs, the Swede was swiftly fastening the straps of his great valise. Once his back happened to be half turned toward the door, and hearing a noise there, he wheeled up and sprang, uttering a loud cry. Scully's wrinkled visage showed grimly in the light of the small lamp he carried. This yellow effulgence, streaming upward, colored only his prominent features and left his eyes, for instance, in a mysterious shadow. He resembled a murderer.
Man, man, he exclaimed, have you gone daffy? Oh, no, 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 rejoined the other. There are people in this world who know pretty nearly as much as you do, understand? For a moment they stood gazing at each other. Upon the Swede's deathly pale cheeks were two spots of brightly crimson and sharply edged as if they'd been carefully painted. Scully placed the light on the table and sat himself on the edge of the bed. He spoke ruminatively. By cracky, I never heard of such a thing in my life. It's a complete muddle. I can't for the soul of me think how you ever got this idea into your head. Presently he lifted his eyes and asked, And did you sure think they were going to kill you? The Swede scanned the old man as if he wished to see into his mind. I did, he said at last. He obviously suspected that this answer might precipitate an outbreak. As he pulled on a strap, his whole arm shook, the elbow wavering like a bit of paper. Scully banged his hand impressively on the footboard of the bed. Why, man, we're going to have a line of electric streetcars in this town next spring. A line of electric streetcars? repeated the Swede stupidly. And, said Scully, there's a new railroad going to be built down from broken arm to here. Not to mention the four churches and the smashing big brick schoolhouse. Then there's the big factory, too. Why, in two years, Rompel will be a metropolis. Having finished the preparation of his baggage, the Swede straightened himself. Mr. Scully, he said with sudden hardihood, how much do I owe you? Well, you don't owe me anything, said the old man angrily. Yes, I do, retorted the Swede. He took 75 cents from his pocket and tendered it to Scully, but the latter snapped his fingers in disdainful refusal. However, it happened that they both stood gazing in a strange fashion at the three silver pieces on the Swede's open palm. I'll not take your money, said Scully at last. Not after what's been going on here. Then a plan seemed to strike him. Here, he cried, picking up his lamp and moving toward the door. Here, come with me a minute. No, said the Swede in overwhelming alarm. Yes, urged the old man. Come on, I want you to come and see a picture, just across the hall in my room. The Swede must have concluded that his hour has come. His jaw dropped and his teeth showed like a dead man's. He ultimately followed Scully across the corridor, but he had the step of one hung in chains. Scully flashed the light high on the wall of his own chamber. There was revealed a ridiculous photograph of a little girl. She was leaning against a balustrade of gorgeous decoration, and the formidable bang to her hair was prominent. The figure was as graceful as an upright sled stick, and withal it was the hue of lead. There, said Scully tenderly, that's the picture of my little girl that died. Her name was Carrie. She had the prettiest hair you ever saw. I was that fond of her. She... Then turning, he saw the Swede was not contemplating the picture at all, but instead was keeping keen watch on the gloom in the rear. Look, man, shouted Scully heartily. That's the picture my little gal died. Her name was Carrie. And here's the picture my oldest boy, Michael. He's a lawyer in Lincoln and doing well. Gave that boy a grand education, and I'm glad for it now. He's a fine boy. Look at him now. Ain't he as bold as blazes him there in Lincoln, an honored and respected gentleman. An honored and respected gentleman, concluded Scully with a flourish. And so saying, he smote the Swede jovially on the back. The Swede faintly smiled. Now, said the old man, there's only one more thing. He dropped suddenly to the floor and thrust his head beneath the bed. The Swede could hear his muffled voice. I'd keep it under me pillar if it weren't for that boy Johnny. Then there's the old woman. Where is it now? I never put it twice in the same place. Ah, now come out with you. Presently he backed clumsily from under the bed, dragging with him an old coat rolled into a bundle. I fetched him, he muttered. Kneeling on the floor, he unrolled the coat and extracted from its heart a large yellow-brown whiskey bottle. His first maneuver was to hold the bottle up to the light. Reassured, apparently, that nobody had been tampering with it, he thrust it in with a generous movement towards the Swede. The weak-kneed Swede was about to eagerly clutch this element of strength, but he suddenly jerked his hand away and cast a look of horror upon Scully. Drink, said the old man affectionately. He had arisen to his feet and now stood facing the Swede. There was silence. Then again Scully said, Drink! The Swede laughed wildly. He grabbed the bottle, put it to his mouth, and as his lips curled absurdly around the opening and his throat worked, he kept his glance burning with hatred upon the old man's face. After the departure of Scully, the three men with the cardboard still upon their knees preserved for a long time in an astounded silence. Then Johnny said, That's the god dangest Swede I ever see. Oh, he ain't no Swede, said the cowboy scornfully. Well, then what is he then, cried Johnny. What is he then? 
It's my opinion, replied the cowboy deliberately, that he's some kind of Dutchman. It was a venerable custom of the country to entitle as Swedes all light-haired men who spoke with a heavy tongue. In consequence, the idea of the cowboy was not without its daring. Yes, sir, he repeated. It's my opinion this feller's some kind of Dutchman. Well, he says he's a Swede anyhow, muttered Johnny sulkily. He turned to the Easterner. What do you think, Mr. Blank? Oh, I, I don't know, replied the Easterner. Well, what do you think makes him act that way? asked the cowboy. Why, he's frightened. The Easterner knocked his pipe against the rim of the stove. He's clear frightened out of his boots. At what? cried Johnny and the cowboy together. The Easterner reflected over his answer. What at? cried the others again. Oh, I don't know. But it seems to me this man has been reading dime novels, and he thinks he's right out in the middle of it, the shooting and stabbing and all. But, said the cowboy deeply scandalized, this ain't Wyoming. Or none of them places. This is Nebraska. Yes, added Johnny. And why don't he wait till he gets out west? The traveled Easterner laughed. It isn't different there, even. Not in these days. But he thinks he's right in the middle of hell. Johnny and the cowboy mused long. Oh, it's awful funny, remarked Johnny at last. Yes, said the cowboy. This is a queer game. I hope we don't get snowed in, because then we'd have to stand this here man being around us all the time. That wouldn't be no good. I wish Pop would throw him out, said Johnny. Presently they heard a loud stamping on the stairs, accompanied by ringing jokes in the voice of old Scully, and laughter, evidently from the Swede. The man around the stove stared vacantly at each other. Gosh, said the cowboy. The door flew open and old Scully, flushed and anecdotal, came into the room. He was jabbering at the Swede, who followed him, laughing bravely. It was the entry of two roisterers from a banquet hall. Come now, said Scully sharply to the three seated men. Move up and give us a chance at the stove. The cowboy and the Easterner obediently sidled their chairs to make room for the newcomers. Johnny, however, simply arranged himself in a more indolent attitude and remained motionless. Come, get over there, said Scully. Plenty of room on the other side of the stove, said Johnny. Do you think we want to sit in the draft, roared the father. But the Swede here interposed with a grandeur of confidence. No, no. Let the boy sit where he likes, he cried in a bullying voice to the father. All right, all right, said Scully deferentially. The cowboy and the Easterner exchanged glances of wonder. Five chairs were formed in a crescent on one side of the stove. The Swede began to talk. He talked arrogantly, profanely, angrily. Johnny, the cowboy, and the Easterner maintained a morose silence, while Scully appeared to be receptive and eager, breaking in constantly with sympathetic ejaculations. Finally, the Swede announced that he was thirsty, and he moved in his chair and said he would go for a drink of water. I'll get it for you, cried Scully at once. No, said the Swede contemptuously. I'll get it for myself. He arose and stalked with the air of an owner off to executive parts of the hotel. As soon as the Swede was out of hearing, Scully sprang to his feet and whispered intensely to the others. Upstairs, he thought I was trying to poison him. Say, said Johnny, this makes me sick. Why don't you throw him out in the snow? Why, he's all right now, declared Scully. It was only that he was from the east and he thought this was a tough place. That's all. He's all right now. The cowboy looked with admiration upon the easterner. You were straight, he said. You were on to that there, Dutchman. Well, said Johnny to his father, he may be all right now, but I don't see it. Other time he was scared and now he's too fresh. Scully's speech was always a combination of Irish brogue and idiom, western twang and idiom, and scraps of curiously formal diction taken from the storybooks and the newspapers. He now hurled a strange mass of language at the head of his son. What do I keep? What do I keep? What do I keep? He demanded in a voice of thunder. He slapped his knee impressively to indicate that he himself was going to make reply and that all should heed. I keep a hotel, he shouted. A hotel, do you mind? A guest under my roof has sacred privileges. He is to be intimidated by none. Not one word shall he hear that would prejudice him in favor of going away. I'll not have it. There's no place in this here town where they can say they ever took a guest of mine because he was afraid to stay here. He wheeled suddenly upon the cowboy and the Easterner. Am I right? Yes, Mr. Scully, said the cowboy. I think you're right. Yes, Mr. Scully, said the Easterner. I think you're right. 
At six o'clock supper, the Swede fizzled like a firewheel. He sometimes seemed on the point of bursting into riotous song, and in all his madness he was encouraged by old Scully. The Easterner was encased in reserve. The cowboy sat in wide-mouthed amazement, forgetting to eat, while Johnny wrathfully demolished great plates of food. The daughters of the house, when they were obliged to replenish the biscuits, approached as warily as Indians, and having succeeded in their purposes, fled with ill-concealed trepidation. The Swede domineered the whole feast, and he gave it the appearance of a cruel bacchanal. He seemed to have grown suddenly taller. He gazed brutally disdainful into every face. His voice rang through the room. Once, when he jabbed out a harpoon fashion with his fork to pinion a biscuit, the weapon nearly impaled the hand of the Easterner, which had been stretched quietly out for the same biscuit. After supper, as the men filed toward the other room, the Swede smote Scully ruthlessly on the shoulder. Well, oh boy, that was a good square meal. Johnny looked hopefully at his father. He knew that shoulder was tender from an old fall, and indeed it appeared for a moment as if Scully was going to flame out over the matter. But in the end... He smiled a sickly smile and remained silent. The others understood from his manner that he was admitting his responsibility for the Swede's new viewpoint. Johnny, however, addressed his parent in an aside. Why don't you license somebody to kick you downstairs? Scully scowled darkly by way of reply. When they were gathered about the stove, the Swede insisted on another game of high five. Scully gently deprecated the plan at first, but the Swede turned a wolfish glare upon him. The old man subsided and the Swede canvassed the others. In his tone, there was always a great threat. The cowboy and the Easterner both remarked indifferently that they would play. Scully said he'd presently have to go meet the 658 train, and so the Swede turned menacingly upon Johnny. For a moment their glances crossed like blades, and then Johnny smiled and said, Yes, I'll play. They formed a square with the little board on their knees. The Easterner and the Swede were again partners. As the play went on, it was noticeable that the cowboy was not board-whacking as usual. Meanwhile, Scully, near the lamp, had put on his spectacles and, with an appearance curious like an old priest, was reading a newspaper. In time, he went out to meet the 658 train, and despite his precautions, a gust of polar wind whirled into the room as he opened the door. Besides scattering the cards, it chilled the players to the marrow. The Swede cursed frightfully. When Scully returned, his entrance disturbed a cozy and friendly scene. The Swede again cursed. But presently they were once more intent, their heads bent forward and their hands moving swiftly. The Swede had adopted the fashion of board whacking. Scully took up his paper and for a long time remained immersed in matters which were extraordinarily remote from him. The lamp burned badly and once he stopped to adjust the wick. The newspaper, as he turned from page to page, rustled with a slow and comfortable sound, and then suddenly he heard three terrible words You are cheating! Such scenes often prove that there can be little dramatic import in the environment. Any room can present a tragic front. Any room can be comic. This little den was now hideous as a torture chamber. The new faces of the men themselves had changed it upon the instant. The Swede held a huge fist in front of Johnny's face while the latter looked steadily over into the blazing orbs of his accuser. The Easterner had grown pallid. The cowboy's draw had dropped in that expression of bovine amazement which was one of his important mannerisms. After the three words, the first sound in the room was made by Scully's paper as it floated forgotten to his feet. His spectacles had also fallen from his nose, but by a clutch he'd saved them in air. His hand, grasping the spectacles, now remained poised awkwardly and near his shoulder. He stared at the card players. Probably the silence was while a second elapsed. Then if the floor had been suddenly twitched out from under the men, they could not have moved quicker. The five had projected themselves headlong toward a common point. It happened that Johnny, in rising to hurl himself upon the Swede, had stumbled slightly because of his curiously instinctive care for the cards and the board. The loss of the moment allowed time for the arrival of Scully, and also allowed the cowboy time to give the Swede a great push, which sent him staggering back. The men found tongue together, and hoarse shouts of rage, appeal, or fear burst from every throat. The cowboy pushed and jostled feverishly at the Swede, and the Eastern and Scully clung wildly to Johnny. But through the smoky air... Above the swaying bodies of the peace compellers, the eyes of the two warriors ever sought each other in glances of challenge that were at once hot and steely. Of course the board had been overturned, and now the whole company of cards were scattered over the floor where the boots of the men trampled the fat and painted kings and queens as they gazed with their silly eyes at the war that was waging above them. Scully's voice was dominating the yells. Stop now! Stop, I say! Stop now! 
Johnny as he struggled to burst through the rank formed by sculling the Easterner was crying. Well, he says I cheated. He says I cheated. I won't allow no man to say I cheated. If he said I cheated, he's a... Cowboy was telling the Swede, Quit now. Quit, do you hear? The screams of the Swede never ceased. He did cheat. I saw him. I saw him. As for the Easterner, he was importuning in a voice that was not heeded. Wait a moment, can't you? Oh, wait a moment. What's the good of a fight over a game of cards? Wait a moment. In this tumult, no complete sentences were clear. Cheat, quit, he says. <clears throat> These fragments pierced the uproar and rang out sharply. It was remarkable that where a scully undoubtedly made the most noise, he was the least heard of any of the riotous band. Then suddenly, there was a great cessation. It was as if each man had paused for breath, and although the room was still lighted with the anger of men, it could be seen that there was no danger of immediate conflict, and at once Johnny, shouldering his way folder, forward, almost succeeded in confronting the Swede. What did you say I cheated for? What did you say I cheated for? I don't cheat, and I won't let no man say I do. The Swede said, I saw you. I saw you. Well, cried Johnny, I'll fight any man that says I cheat. No, you won't, said the cowboy. Not here. Ah, be still, can't you, said Scully, coming between them. The quiet was sufficient to allow the Easterner's voice to be heard. He was repeating, wait a moment, can't you? What's the good of a fight over a game of cards? Wait a moment. Johnny, his red face appearing above his father's shoulder, hailed the Swede again. Did you say I cheated? The Swede showed his teeth. Yes. Then said Johnny, we must fight. Yes, fight, roared the Swede. He was like a demoniac. Yes, fight, I'll show you what kind of man I am. I'll show you who you want to fight. Maybe you think I can't fight, maybe you think I can't. I'll show you, you skin, you card sharp. Yes, you cheated, you cheated, you cheated. Well, let's get at it then, mister, said Johnny coolly. The cowboy's brow was beaded with sweat from his efforts in intercepting all sorts of raids. He turned in despair to Scully. What you gonna do now? A change had come over the Celtic visage of the old man. He now seemed all eagerness. His eyes glowed. We'll let them fight, he answered stalwartly. I can't put up with it any longer. I've stood this damn Swede till I'm sick. We'll let them fight. The men prepared to go out of doors. The Easterner was so nervous that he had great difficulty in getting his arms into the sleeves of his new leather coat. As the cowboy drew his fur cap down over his ears, his hands trembled. In fact, Johnny and Old Scully were the only ones who displayed no agitation. These preliminaries were conducted without words. Scully threw open the door. Well, come on, he said. Instantly, a terrific wind caused the flame of the lamp to struggle at its wick, while a puff of black smoke sprang from the chimney top. The stove was in mid-current of the blast, and its voice swelled to equal the roar of the storm. Some of the scarred and bedabbled cards were caught up from the floor and dashed helplessly against the further wall. The men lowered their heads and plunged into the tempest as into a sea. No snow was falling, but great whirls and clouds of flakes swept up from the ground by the frantic winds were streaming southward with the speed of bullets. The covered land was blue with the sheen of an unearthly satin, and there was no other hue save where the low black railway station, which seemed incredibly distant, one light gleamed like a tiny jewel. As the men floundered into thigh-deep drift, it was known that the Swede was bowling out something. Scully went to him, put a hand on his shoulder, and projected an ear. "'What's that, you say?' he shouted. "'I say,' bawled the Swede again, "'I won't stand much show against this gang. "'I know you'll all pitch on me.' Scully smote him reproachfully on the arm. "'Tut, man!' he yelled. The wind tore the words from the Scully's lips and scattered them farly. "'You are all a gang of—' boomed the Swede, but the storm also seemed to seize the remainder of the sentence. Immediately turning their backs upon the wind, the men had swung around a corner to the sheltered side of the hotel. It was the function of the little house to preserve here amid this great devastation of snow an irregular V-shape of heavily encrusted grass, which crackled beneath the feet. One could imagine the great drifts piled against the windward side. When the party reached the comparative peace of this spot, it was found that the Swede was still bellowing. Oh, I know what kind of thing this is. I know you all pitch on me. I can't lick you all. Scully turned upon him panther fashion. You'll not have to whip all of us. You'll have to whip my son Johnny. And the man that troubles you during that time will have me to deal with. The arrangements were swiftly made. 
The two men faced each other, obedient to the harsh commands of Scully, whose face in the subtly luminous gloom could have been seen set in austere, impersonal lines that are pictured on the countenances of the Roman veterans. The Easterner's teeth were chattering, and he was hopping up and down like a mechanical toy. The cowboy stood rock-like. The contestants had not stripped off any clothing. Each was in his ordinary attire. Their fists were up, and they eyed each other in a calm that had the elements of leonine cruelty in it. During this pause, the Easterner's mind like a film took lasting impressions of three men, the iron-nerved master of the ceremony, the Swede, pale, motionless, and terrible, and Johnny, serene yet ferocious, brutish yet heroic. The entire prelude had in it a tragedy greater than the tragedy of action, and this aspect was accentuated by the long, mellow cry of the blizzard as it sped the tumbling and wailing flakes into the black abyss of the south. Now, said Scully, the two combatants leaped forward and crashed together like bullocks. There was heard the cushioned sound of blows and of a curse squeezing out from between the tight teeth of one. As for the spectators, the Easterner's pent-up breath exploded from him with a pop of relief, absolute relief from the tension of the preliminaries. The cowboy bounded into the air with a yowl. Scully was immovable as from supreme amazement and fear at the fury of the fight, which he himself had permitted and arranged. For a time, the encounter in the darkness was such a perplexity of flying arms that it presented no more detail than what a swiftly revolving wheel. Occasionally a face, as if illumined by a flash of light, would shine out, ghastly and marked with pink spots. A moment later, the men might have been known as shadows, if it were not for the involuntary utterance of oaths that came from them in whispers. Suddenly a holocaust of warlike desire caught the cowboy, and he bolted forward with the speeder bronco. Go it, Johnny, go it! Kill him! Kill him! Scully confronted him. Cape back, he said, and by his glance the cowboy could tell this man was Johnny's father. To the Easterner there was a monotony of unchangeable fighting that was an abomination. This confused mingling was eternal to his sense, which was concentrated in a longing for the end, the priceless end. Once the fighters lurched near him, and as he scrambled hastily backward, he heard them breathe like men on the rack. Kill him, Johnny! Kill him! Kill him! Kill him! The cowboy's face was contorted like one of those agony masks in museums. Keep still, said Scully icily. Then there was the sudden loud grunt, incomplete, cut short, and Johnny's body swung away from the Swede and fell with sickening heaviness to the grass. The cowboy was barely in time to prevent the mad Swede from flinging himself upon his prone adversary. No, you don't, said the cowboy, interposing an arm. Wait a second. Scully was at its sun side. Johnny, Johnny, my boy. His voice had a quality of melancholy tenderness. Johnny, can you go on with it? He looked anxiously down into the bloody, pulpy face of his son. There was a moment of silence, and then Johnny answered in his ordinary voice. Yes, I... Yes. Assisted by his father, he struggled to his feet. Wait a bit now till you get you in, said the old man. A few paces away, the cowboy was lecturing the Swede. No, you don't. Wait a second. The Easterner was plucking at Scully's sleeve. Oh, this is enough, he pleaded. This is enough. Let it go as it stands. This is enough. Bill, said Scully, get out of the road. The cowboy stepped aside. Now. The combatants were accentuated, actuated by a new caution as they advanced toward collision. They glared at each other, and then the Swede aimed a lightning blow that carried with it his entire weight. Johnny was evidently half stupid from weakness, but he miraculously dodged, and his fist sent the overbalanced Swede sprawling. The cowboy, Scully, and the Easterner burst into a cheer that was like a chorus of triumphant soldiery. But before its conclusion, the Swede had scuffled agilely to his feet and come in berserk abandoned at his foe. There was another perplexity of flying arms, and Johnny's body again swung away and fell, even as a bundle might fall from a roof. The Swede instantly staggered to a little wind-waved tree and leaned upon it, breathing like an engine while his savage and flame-lit eyes roamed from face to face as the men bent over Johnny. There was a splendor of isolation in his situation at this time, which the Easterner felt once when, lifting his eyes from the man on the ground, he beheld that mysterious and lonely figure waiting. "'Are you any good yet, Johnny?' asked Scully in a broken voice. The son gasped and opened his eyes languidly. After a moment, he answered, "'No, I ain't any good anymore.' Then from shame and bodily ill, he began to weep, the tears furring down through the bloodstains on his face. He was too, too heavy for me. Scully straightened and addressed the waiting figure. 
Stranger, he said evenly, it's all up with our side. Then his voice changed in that vibrant huskiness, which is commonly the tone of the most simple and deadly announcements. Johnny is whipped. Without replying, the victor moved off on the route to the front door of the hotel. The cowboy was formulating new and unspellable blasphemies. The Easterner was startled to find that they were out in a wind that seemed to come direct from the shadowed Arctic flows. He heard again the wail of the snow as it was flung to its grave in the south. He knew now that all this time the cold had been sinking into him deeper and deeper, and he wondered that he'd not perished. He felt indifferent to the condition of the vanquished man. "'Johnny, can you walk?' asked Scully. "'Did I hurt, did I hurt him any?' asked the son. "'Can you walk, boy? Can you walk?' Johnny's voice was suddenly strong. There was a robust impatience in it. I asked you whether I heard him, Annie. Yes, yes, Johnny, answered the cowboy consolingly. He's heard a good deal. They raised him from the ground, and as soon as he was on his feet, he went tottering off, rebuffing all attempts at assistance. When the party rounded the corner, they were fairly blinded by the pelting of the snow. It burned their faces like fire. The cowboy carried Johnny through the drift to the door. As he entered, some cards again rose from the floor and beat against the wall. The Easterner rushed to the stove. He was so profoundly chilled that he almost dared to embrace the glowing iron. The Swede was not in the room. Johnny sank into a chair, folding his arms on his knees and burying his face in them. Scully, warming one foot and then the other at the rim of the stove, muttered to himself with Celtic mournfulness. The cowboy had removed his fur cap, and with a dazed and rueful air, he was now running one hand through his tousled locks. From overhead, they could hear the creaking of the boards as the Swede tramped here and there in his room. The sad quiet was broken by the sudden flinging open of a door that led toward the kitchen. It was instantly followed by an inrush of women. They precipitated themselves upon Johnny amid a chorus of lamentation. Before they carried their prey off to the kitchen, there to be bathed and harangued with that mixture of sympathy and abuse which is a feat of their sex, the mother straightened herself and fixed old Scully with an eye of stern reproach. "'Shame be upon you, Patrick Scully,' she cried. "'Your own son, too. Shame be upon you.' "'There now, be quiet now,' said the old man weakly. "'Shame be upon you, Patrick Scully.' The girls rallying to the slogan, sniffed disdainfully in the direction of those trembling accomplices, the cowboy and the Easterner. Presently they bore Johnny away and left the three men to dismal reflection. "'I'd like to fight this here Dutchman myself,' said the cowboy, breaking a long silence. Scully wagged his head sadly. "'No, that wouldn't do. Wouldn't be right.' Wouldn't be right. Well, why wouldn't it, argued the cowboy. I don't see no harm in it. No, answered Scully with mournful heroism. Wouldn't be right. It was Johnny's fight, and now we mustn't whip the man just because he whipped Johnny. Yes, that's true enough, said the cowboy. But he better not get fresh with me because I couldn't stand no more of it. You'll not say a word to him, commanded Scully, and even they heard the tread of the suite on the stairs. His entrance was made theatric. He swept the door back with a bang and swaggered to the middle of the room. No one looked at him. Well, he cried insolently at Scully, I suppose you'll tell me now how much I owe you. The old man remained stolid. You don't owe me nothing. Huh, said the Swede. Huh, don't owe him nothing. The cowboy addressed the Swede. Stranger, I don't see how you come to be so funny around here. Old Scully was instantly alert. Stop, he shouted, holding his hand forth, fingers upward. Bill, you shut up. The cowboy spat carelessly into the sawdust box. I didn't say a word, did I? He asked. Mr. Scully called the Swede. How much do I owe you? It was seen that he was attired for departure and that he had his valise in his hand. You don't owe me nothing, repeated Scully in his same imperturbable way. Huh, said the Swede. I guess you're right. I guess if it was any way at all, you'd owe me something. That's what I'd guess. He turned to the cowboy. Kill him, kill him, kill him, he mimicked, and then guffawed victoriously. Kill him! He was convulsed with ironical humor. But he might have been jeering the dead. The three men were immovable and silent, staring with glassy eyes at the stove. The Swede opened the door and passed into the storm, giving one derisive glance backward at the still group. As soon as the door was closed, Scully and the cowboy leaped to their feet and began to curse. They trampled to and fro, waving their arms and smashing into the air with their fists. Oh, but that was a hard minute, wailed Scully. That was a hard minute. Him there leering and scoffing. One bang at his nose was worth $40 to me that minute. How did you stand it, Bill? 
How did I stand it? cried the cowboy in a quivering voice. How did I stand it? The old man burst into sudden brogue. I'd like to take that Swede, he wailed, and hound him down to Chanfleur and bait him to jelly with a shtick. The cowboy groaned in sympathy. I'd like to get him by the neck and hammer him. He brought his hand down on a chair with a noise like a pistol shot. Hammer that there Dutchman till he couldn't tell himself from a dead coyote. I'd bait him till he... I'd show him some things. And then together they raised a yearning, frantic cry. Oh, if only we could. Yes. And then I'd... Oh. The Swede, tightly gripping his valise, tacked across the face of the storm as if he carried sails. He was following a line of little naked gasping trees, which he knew must mark the way of the road. His face, fresh from the pounding of Johnny's fish, fists, felt more pleasurable than the pain in the wind and the driving snow. A number of square shapes loomed upon him finally, and he knew them as the houses of the main body of the town. He found a street and made travel along it, leaning heavily upon the wind wherever at a corner the terrific blast caught him. He might have been in a deserted village. We picture the world as thick with conquering and elate humanity, but here with the bugles of the tempest pealing, it was hard to imagine a peopled earth. One viewed the existence of a man then as a marvel, and conceded a glamour of wonder to these lice, which were caused to cling to a whirling, fire-smote, ice-locked, disease-stricken, space-lost bulb. The conceit of man was explained by the storm to be the very engine of life. One was a coxcomb not to die in it. However, the Swede found a saloon. In front of it, an indomitable red light was burning, and the snowflakes were made blood color as they flew through the circumscribed territory of the lamps shining. The Swede pushed open the door of the saloon and entered. A sanded expanse was before him, and at the end of it four men sat about a table drinking. Down one side of the room extended a radiant bar, and its guardian was leaning upon his elbows, listening to the talk of the men at the table. The Swede dropped his valise upon the floor, and smiling fraternally upon the barkeeper, said, Give me some whiskey, will ya? The man placed a bottle, a whiskey glass, and a glass of ice-thick water upon the bar. The Swede poured himself an abnormal portion of whiskey and drank it in three gulps. Pretty bad night, remarked the bartender indifferently. He was making the pretension of blindness, which is usually a distinction of his class, but it could have been seen that he was furtively studying the half-erased bloodstains on the face of the Swede. Bad night, he said again. Oh, it's good enough for me, replied the Swede, heartily as he poured himself some more whiskey. The barkeeper took his coin and maneuvered it through the reception by the highly nickeled cash machine. A bell rang. A card labeled 20 cents had appeared. No, continued the Swede. This isn't too bad weather. It's good enough for me. So, the murmured barkeeper langu languidly, the copious drams made the Swede's eyes swim, and he breathed a trifle heavier. Yeah, I like this weather. I like it. It suits me. It was apparently his design to impart a deep significance to these words. So, murmured the bartender again, he turned to gaze dreamily at the scroll-like birds and the bird-like scrolls which had been drawn with soap upon the mirrors of the bar. Well, I guess I'll take another drink, said the Swede presently. Have something? No, thanks. I'm not drinking, answered the bartender. Afterward, he asked, How'd you hurt your face? The Swede immediately began to boast loudly. Why, in a fight, I thumped the soul out of a man down here at Scully's Hotel. The interest of the four men at the table was at last aroused. Who was it, said one. Johnny Scully, blustered the Swede, son of the man that runs it. He'll be pretty near dead for some weeks, I can tell you. I made a nice thing of him, I did. He couldn't get up. They carried him in the house. Have a drink? Instantly, the men, in some subtle way, encased themselves in a reserve. No thanks, said one. The group was of a curious formation. Two were prominent local businessmen. One was a district attorney. One was a professional gambler of the kind known as Square. But a scrutiny of the group would not have enabled an observer to pick the gambler from the men of more reputable pursuits. He was, in fact, a man so delicate in manner that when among people of fair class and so judicious in his vo choice of victims that in the strictly masculine part of the town's life he'd come to be explicitly trusted and admired. People called him a thoroughbred. The fear and contempt with which his craft was regarded was undoubtedly the reason that his quiet dignity shone conspicuous above the quiet dignity of men who might be merely hatters, billiard markers, or grocery clerks. Beyond an occasional unwary traveler who came by rail, 
This gambler was supposed to prey solely upon reckless and senile farmers, who, when flush with good crops, drove into town all the pride and confidence of an absolutely invulnerable stupidity. Hearing at times in circuitous fashion the despoilment of such a farmer, the important men of Romper invariably laughed in contempt of the victim, and if they thought of the wolf at all, it was with a kind of pride at the knowledge that he would never dare think of attacking their wisdom and courage. Besides, it was popular that the gambler had a real wife and two real children in a neat cottage in a suburb where he led an exemplary home life, and when anyone even suggested a discrepancy in his character, the crowd immediately vociferated descriptions of this virtuous family circle. The men who led exemplary home lives and men who did not lead exemplary home lives all subsided in a bunch, remarking that there was nothing more to be said. However, when a restriction was placed upon him, as for instance when a strong clique of members of the new Pollywog Club refused to permit him, even as a spectator, to appear in the rooms of the organization, the candor and gentleness with which he accepted the judgment disarmed many of his foes and made his friends more desperately partisan. He invariably distinguished between himself and a respectable romper man so quickly and frankly that his manner actually appeared to be continually broadcast compliments. And one must not forget to declare the fundamental fact of his entire position in ramp romper. It is irrefutable that in all affairs outside of his business, in all matters that occur eternally and commonly between man and man, this thieving card player was so generous, so just, so moral, that in a contest he could have put to flight the consciences of nine-tenths of the citizens of Romper. And so it happened that he was seated in the saloon with two prominent local merchants and the district attorney. The Swede continued to drink raw whiskey, meanwhile, babbling at the barkeeper and trying to induce him to indulge in potations. Come on, have a drink, come on. What, no? We'll have a little one, then. By God, I've whipped a man tonight and I want to celebrate. I whipped him good, too. Gentlemen, said the Swede at the men at the table. Have a drink? Shh, said the barkeeper. The group at the table, although furtively attentive, had been pretending to be deep in talk. But now a man lifted his eyes toward the Swede and said shortly, Thanks. We don't want any more. At this reply, the Swede ruffled out his chest like a rooster. Well, he exploded, it seems I can't get anybody to drink with me in this town. Seems so, don't it? Well, shh, said the barkeeper. Say, snarled the Swede, don't you try to shut me up. I won't have it. I'm a gentleman and I want people to drink with me. And I want them to drink with me now. Now, do you understand? He rapped the bar with his knuckles. Years of experience had calloused the bartender. He merely grew sulky. I hear you, he answered. Well, cried the Swede, listen hard then. See those men over there? Well, they're going to drink with me and don't you forget it. Now you watch. Hey, yelled the barkeeper, this won't do. Why won't it, demanded the Swede. He stalked over to the table and by chance laid his hand upon the shoulder of the gambler. How about this, he answered, uh, asked wrathfully. I asked you to drink with me. The gambler simply twisted his head and spoke over his shoulder. Friend, I don't know you. Oh, hell, answered the Swede. Come, have a drink. Now, my boy, advised the gambler kindly, take your hand off my shoulder and go away and mind your own business. He was a little slim man, and it seemed strange to hear him use this tone of heroic patronage to the burly Swede. The other men at the table said nothing. What? You won't drink with me? You little dude, I'll make you then. I'll make you. The Swede had grasped the gambler frenziedly at the throat and was dragging him from his chair. The other men sprang up. The barkeeper dashed around the corner of his bar. There was a great tumult, and then there was seen a long blade in the hand of the gambler. It shot forward in a human body, this citadel of virtue, wisdom, and power, was pierced as easily if it had been a melon. The Swede fell with a cry of supreme astonishment. The prominent merchants and the district attorney must have at once tumbled out of the place backward. The bartender found himself hanging limply to the arm of a chair and gazing into the eyes of a murderer. Henry, said the latter as he wiped his knife on one of the towels that hung beneath the bar rail. You tell him where to find me. I'll be home waiting for him. Then he vanished. A moment afterward, the barkeeper was in the street, dinning through the storm for help, and moreover, companionship. The corpse of the Swede alone in the saloon had its eyes fixed upon a dreadful legend that dwelt atop the cash machine. This registers the amount of your purchase. Months later, the cowboys frying pork over the stove of the little ranch near the Dakota line, and there was a quick thud of hoofs outside, and presently, the Easterner entered with letters and papers. Well, the Easterner said at once, 
The chap that killed the Swede has got three years. Wasn't much, was it? He has? Three years? The cowboy poised his pan of pork while he ruminated upon the news. Three years? Well, that ain't much. No, it was a light sentence, replied the Easterner as he unbuckled his spurs. Seems there was a good deal of sympathy for him in Romper. Well, if the bartender had been any good, observed the cowboy thoughtfully, he would have gone in and cracked that there Dutchman on the head with the bottle in the beginning of it and stopped all this here murdering. Yes, a thousand things might have happened, said the Easterner tartly. The cowboy returned his pan of pork to the fire, but his philosophy continued. It's funny, ain't it? If he hadn't said Johnny was cheating, he'd be alive this minute. He was an awful fool. Game played for fun, too. Not for money. I believe he was crazy. I feel sorry for that gambler, said the Easterner. Oh, so do I, said the cowboy. He don't deserve none of it for killing who he did. The Swede might not have been killed if everything had been square. Might not have been killed, exclaimed the cowboy. Everything's square? Why, when he said that Johnny was cheating and acted like such jackass? And in the saloon he fairly walked up to get hurt. With these arguments, the cowboy browbeat the Easterner and reduced him to rage. You're a fool, cried the Easterner viciously. You're a bigger jackass than the Swede by a million majority. Now let me tell you one thing. Let me tell you something. Listen, Johnny was cheating. Johnny, said the cowboy blankly. There was a minute of silence, and then he said robustly, Why, no, the game was only for fun. Fun or not, said the Easterner. Johnny was cheating. I saw him. I know it. I saw him. And I refused to stand up and be a man. I let the Swede fight it out alone. And you? You were simply puffing around the place and wanting to fight. And then old Scully himself were all in it. This poor gambler isn't even a noun. He's kind of an adverb. Every sin is the result of a collaboration. We, five of us, have collaborated in the murder of this Swede. Usually there are from a dozen to forty women really involved in every murder. But in this case, it seems to be only five men. You, I... Johnny, old Scully, and that fool of an unfortunate gambler came merely as a culmination, the apex of a human movement, and he gets all the punishment. The cowboy, injured and rebellious, cried out blindly into this fog of mysterious theory. Well, I didn't do anything, did I?